This month we're looking at the foundations of our faith, and the title of today's message is Jesus, Our Lord and Savior is King. It's a, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Um, you know, the title might be a bit long and, and perhaps it may be even a little clunky, but Dave and I landed on this because we believe in this series of faith IRL in real life, uh, this foundational idea bringing together Jesus, Lord and Savior, which is very common in our confession of faith, in our understanding of who Jesus is, and bringing those three titles together. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is King. And this idea of Jesus being our King is really the backbone of how we need to think about Jesus. Remember, our entire series is framed on this passage from Romans 12 too, as the NLT translates it, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. Some other translations may have uh, by the renewal of our mind or renewing our minds. The, of course, when we have minds that are made new, that changes how we think. And that's how God is going to transform us, by changing the way we think. And how we think about Jesus is foundational to all of life as Christian people. We often talk about Jesus as Savior, as Jesus as Lord, and we don't really struggle about that. I mean, Jesus is called Lord all through the New Testament, and that's just a title that He has, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. No problem. Uh, in fact, the, the idea of Jesus is Lord was one of the very first confessions of the early church. And as Baptists, Canadian Baptists, it is actually the motto of Canadian Baptists, Jesus is Lord, a good biblical motto. We can see how important it is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, when Paul says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, when Paul says that, he's meaning more than Jesus is the boss, although it certainly doesn't mean less than that. For Paul, this idea of Jesus being Lord is rooted in the, the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And every time that the, the, the name for God, the divine name, was in the Hebrew text, the Greek translators translated that as Lord. And so the, the Jewish readers always knew when they came across that word, Lord, it was actually the name of God. And just like in our English translations, we have the small capital letters for Lord, which indicates that the, the Hebrew text actually has the name of God being used in that particular passage. And so for Paul, as he talks about Jesus being Lord, he's thinking of it in divine terms. He's thinking it in terms of the connection between Jesus and God. That at the, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul's thinking big. Not just that Jesus is the boss, but sometimes we get thinking so big in terms of Jesus is Lord that we forget that Jesus is the boss. Jesus is the King. And I want to just draw our attention to a couple of places in Scripture where it's clear that Jesus is in fact thought of and seen and declared as King. And the first one is right in Matthew's Gospel when we read about Jesus' birth. And we see the Magi coming to, uh, to visit Israel so that they can worship the King of the Jews, the King of Israel. And they stop in and see Herod. And Herod really is almost taken back by this. He takes this very seriously. And we know that he takes it seriously because Matthew's Gospel tells us how Herod killed an entire village worth of children to protect his kingship. And that's very Herodian, if you know your history, because Herod killed his wife and he killed his sons when they started to threaten his kingdom, his kingship. He took his kingship very seriously. 
and we see the, the Matthew, uh, Matthew tells us about Joseph and Mary, Joseph being warned in a dream to get out of the country, and he goes off and they live as refugees in Egypt uh, for a season until Herod was dead, and then it was safe for them to come back. But all of this because Jesus was seen as the king. In John's Gospel, when Nathanael comes to faith in, in Jesus, comes to see Him as indeed the, the Messiah, he declares, this is John 1, verse 49, Rabbi, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You are the King of Israel. That was the initial declaration of Nathanael when he came to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Himself, when He talks about um, the 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 his return, uh, he talks about it as the, when the great king returns, he will divide the people like a shepherd divides the sheep and the goats. And then that's judgment. I mean, that's the second coming of Jesus. We know what Jesus is talking about when he tells the story, but he frames it as when the great king returns. Jesus refers to himself as the great king. And perhaps the most clear expression of Jesus being king is in the final scene of the Gospels where Jesus is before Pilate and he's being tried and he's ultimately condemned for being the king of the Jews. On the top of every Roman cross is the charge of, of the criminal who's dying so that people who are walking by and see the crucified person can read the charge. So the thief on the one side would have said, you know, thief or burglary. Uh, maybe on the other side it was insurrection or treason. But for Jesus, in three languages, we read, or we, we would have read, King of the Jews. And that bothered the, his accusers. They said, no, 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 no. Say, he said he was King of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And there we have it on, in, in Roman law, in the Roman documents, and on the Roman cross, we have the charge against Jesus was that he was King of the Jews. A rejected King of the Jews. And it's with all that in mind that we come to today's passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 17, right through till 4, verse 1. I want to read this. If you have a device or uh, you can follow along uh, on the screen, um, if you have a Bible, uh, if you're going old school, uh, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 17. I'm going to read from the NIV. Obviously, you can read from whatever version you want to. Uh, reading at verse 13, uh, 17 of chapter 3. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Philippians chapter 3, 17 to 4, 1. I want to make a couple of points, three broad points connected to this idea of Jesus as King and then relate it back to this passage in Philippians chapter 3. Now, if you have an outline, uh, you can sort of follow along the basic framework of what I'm talking about. Um, the first point is that the word of the king is final. Uh, Jesus has the final word because he is king. And we need to understand that, uh, that idea of the king having the final word of the king being the final authority in this Roman world. In fact, the word king, as it was understood by the Jewish people and used by the Jewish people, was understood by the Roman people, who spoke a different language and had a different culture, as emperor. 
And so if you had a, a king who was not Caesar, uh, you, were, you were treasonous. You, that was a capital crime, as we saw in the death of Jesus. If you say that you're a king, you're competing with the Roman emperor. In Acts 17.7, we see that Christians got in trouble for this very reason. It says that they dragged out Jason and some of the other believers and took them before the city council. And this is the quote from the accusers. They said, Paul and Silas have caused trouble all over the world, they shouted. And now they're here disturbing our city too. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are all guilty of treason against Caesar. For they profess allegiance to another king named Jesus. <laughs> another king named Jesus. The early Christians declared Jesus as Lord. They declared Jesus as Savior. They declared Jesus as King. And because of that, that put them in trouble with Rome. They would be dragged out of their homes and brought before the city councils, the magistrates, and accused of treason because they had allegiance to another king. And his name was Jesus. The, the text of Scripture uh, over and over again relates to us this idea that Jesus' word is the final word. That the word of the king is final. Just a few weeks ago, um, uh, we looked at um, Paul defending himself in front of Festus and Agrippa. And the reason he was before these Roman magistrates, these Roman leaders, governors, was because he appealed to Caesar. He was about to be killed by an angry mob, and as a Roman citizen, he had the right to make an appeal to Caesar. He could appeal to the final authority. There was no authority beyond Caesar. When Caesar judged a case, that was the final word. Because he was king. He was emperor. And Jesus, in the Christian mind, in the Christian world, in the Christian way of thinking, he is our king. He is our final authority. There's no one else to go to after Jesus for an opinion or an idea. He is our final word. When Jesus says, love your enemies, there's no one else to go to to tweak that a bit to make it a little easier for us. It's going to be hard, but it's the final word. When Jesus says, forgive people 70 times, 7 times, or 77 times, a lot, <laughs> We don't say, oh, well, you know, just do it, forgive three or four times, and then beyond that, you're an enabler. Don't do that. Look, there are lots of ways to not be an enabler and still be forgiving. We need to hear what Jesus is saying. God forgives us lavishly. He never tires of forgiving us. He is gracious beyond measure. And we need to imitate that in our lives. Jesus' word is the final word because Jesus is our king, and the word of the king is final. In the letter uh, of Hebrews, the writer there spends the whole first part of his message talking about how Jesus is the final word. I mean, just listen to this text taken from Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 4. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through Him also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. The writer of Hebrews is communicating, hey, guess what? Jesus is God's final Word to us. This is the final thing that God is saying in terms of salvation, in terms of who we listen to, how we direct our lives. The word of the king is final. Now, I want to do something that um, was unplanned. Uh, when Dave and I came up with this outline and we sent it all off to the, uh, uh, you know, our, our design staff and uh, they got that already, printed it out and all that. So you have your hand out and uh, you've got two points there. As I was writing this, I realized these two points really are just one point. They're just one point and I need to, and I was trying to untangle them 
to, to make it fit the outline, and I realized, no, 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 I, I need to just leave these two ideas together, and uh, you being smart people will be able to figure it out. So, you know, the, the outline has the way of the king is the cross, and the demand of the king is loyalty. And I want to put those two together, that the way of the king is loyalty shaped by the cross. It's not just any kind of loyalty. It's a very specific kind of loyalty. It's loyalty that is cruciform, as they would say, the theologians. It is cross-shaped. It is shaped by the cross. And we need to see it that way. Um, Clearly, Jesus is our King. The Scriptures are over and over again talking about this idea of Jesus being our King. And we know that that puts us in opposition to other kings who want our ultimate loyalty. And we have to understand that if we are going to say Jesus is our king, then that means that we need to be, if we are followers of Jesus, we need to be loyal to him. We need to be loyal subjects of King Jesus. When Paul uses this phrase in Philippians, citizens of heaven, or we have our citizenship there in heaven, he's speaking very technically to the Philippian people, the Philippian Christians. Philippi was a Roman city. Uh, It was made up of people who were Roman citizens. They knew that if they were attacked by some invading force, they could look to Rome to save them. They would look to Rome and get a savior from there. That was how the world worked. And we know this when we read through history, that that is exactly how the world worked. We, we, we read the word for savior in Greek is soter, and you'll see those letters, S-O-T-E-R, as a name for various leaders throughout ancient history. Ptolemy I, soter, savior. That's what that means. We don't translate it, but that's what it means. Antiochus I, Soter. These are their names. Demetrius I, Soter. Eumenes II, Soter. You get my point. These leaders who came in and saved the day love to put that title at the end of their name, Soter, Savior. They had big egos. And this was a political designation. You were a military leader. You had power. You saved a people. And so when Paul says that we're citizens of heaven and we await a savior from there, a rescuer from there, he's clearly making a, well, he's making a faith statement, but he's also making a political statement to those who would fix their hopes in the leaders of this world to fix all their problems and solve all their woes. Paul says we're citizens of another place. And because we're citizens of heaven and being loyal subjects to King Jesus, we wait for a Savior from there who is, of course, our King and our Lord and our Savior. Paul calls, he basically talks about us being citizens of heaven, followers of Jesus being king, uh, uh, citizens of heaven in contrast to those who think only about this world who are fixated on this world and he says their 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 uh, god is their bellies you know they're just after the pleasures of this world they're just trying to make it all seem okay they're just trying to have a good time but paul says that when we have a loyalty that's not to king jesus but to this world we are ultimately enemies of the cross And this is why our loyalty is shaped by the cross. It's not just a scattered loyalty where sometimes we follow Jesus and sometimes we don't. You know, maybe it's too hard. Maybe it's too difficult. Maybe it's going to cost us something. Maybe we feel we deserve better. The list goes on and on. But if we're going to be faithful, loyal servants of Jesus of King Jesus, then that means that we embrace the cross. And the cross, at first and foremost, you know, the word cross for us, it's just a sort of a religious term now. 
We know that historically it was used to execute criminals, but it's become something else. It's kind of been used so much that we don't really have that emotional response when we hear the word cross. But when we think of the word noose, maybe, noose, you know, we think of all the stories of the past where someone was noosed, where they were taken by a band of zealots or thieves or whatever, and then they were hung from a tree. And that old idea of a noose is an ugly word. It's an ugly term. And it creates, a, it creates an emotional response in us because we see it as an as a injustice. We see it as, a, as something which represents a evil power oppressing others. Well, that's how people thought about the word cross in the first century. Cicero, a Roman writer, Roman lawyer, basically didn't even like to, th- to say the word. He, he, he saw the word um, cross as being horrid. He called it the punishment of slaves. And he says in one of his writings that it was unthinkable for a Roman citizen to be crucified. So low was that form of punishment. So terrible was that word itself that the estate, the the, the nobility of a Roman. It was unthinkable that they would be crucified. And here we have in our story of the Gospel, Jesus' kingship mocked. They put a crown of thorns on Him. They beat Him and told Him to prophesy who hit Him. You saved others, now save yourself. And then they took our King Jesus and they hung Him and killed Him on a Roman cross, the slave's punishment. And yet, right to the end, Jesus obeyed His Father. He was a faithful son to His Father in heaven. He embraced the cross. We see in Gethsemane, that wasn't His first choice. Father, if You can take this cup away, that'd be awesome. But not My will, but Your will be done. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was loyal to His Father, even to the point of going to the cross. And Jesus calls us to be loyal to Him. Loyal to King Jesus. You know, we talk a lot about being uh, saved by faith, and, and we should. It's a very biblical idea. We know that we can't do anything on our own to save ourselves. It's by God's grace. It's by God's uh, mercy alone through Jesus Christ and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. One thing we don't get in our English translations, though, is the deep connection in this word um, faith in the original language to the idea of faithfulness. In fact, uh, Matthew Bates, a New Testament scholar, just released a book not too long ago um, called um, Uh, salvation by allegiance alone because he sees this idea of faith and faithfulness being so intertwined that you just can't pull them apart and so many times in the new testament you have this one single word pistis being translated in one place it's faith another place it's faithfulness in one place it's a faith that's obeyed something that we do another place it's something we believe But we've separated these ideas too much. If we're going to be a people of faith, it's more than just having dreamy ideas about uh, theology or about our our eternal dwelling. It's also about being faithful. If all of a sudden an alarm went off in the building here, we would all get up and we would make our way following our plan of what to do in case of an emergency. The alarm indicates that there's an emergency. And if we have faith in the alarm, we respond by action. That's how faith and action work. That's how being loyal to a king works. We believe in our king, we believe our king, and therefore we have allegiance to our king. We are loyal to his way. It is a loyalty that is shaped by the cross. 
You know, Dallas Willard once wrote that the Gospel is less about how to get into the Kingdom of Heaven after you die and more about how to live in the Kingdom of Heaven before you die. And there's a truth to that. We need to look at this idea of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is King and understand that His Word is the final word and that we need to be loyal to our King. And not just any kind of loyalty, but loyalty that may cost us. A loyalty that's marked by the cross. Now, the earliest Christians, they were fed to lions. They were killed in most terrible ways because of their allegiance to King Jesus. They were accused of treason. They were accused of crimes against Rome simply because they said there was another king. Now guess what? We're probably not going to go to the lion's den or go to the, you know, put to death because we believe in King Jesus. Not in our country. In other countries, that's not necessarily the case. But here, for us, you know, we're pretty safe. We can actually be loyal to Jesus and not have to worry about being executed for it. But we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that having Jesus as our King won't cost us anything. Because ultimately, it costs us everything. When we, when we state that our loyalty to Jesus is ultimate, it means that other things are not ultimate in our loyalty. We can't put other things in that first place, in that first position. And we have to be okay with that. We have to remember that the, you know, if Jesus' word if, as king is the final word and his commandment to us is to love one another, therefore we are a, a loyal people of love, loving God and loving one another and loving our neighbor, and that is the, the, the primary mark of our lives, guess what? That's going to cost us. It costs us something of ourselves when we choose to love in this Jesus way. Jesus, our Savior and Lord, is King. His Word is the final word. And His way is cruciform loyalty. Loyalty shaped by the cross. It's His way, and it must be our way too. If we are to be true citizens of heaven, if we're truly awaiting a Savior from there, it needs to mark our lives here and now as we pledge allegiance to our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You show us who our King is. That we don't have to root around to try to figure out who's the big boss. We know, God, that You have sent Your Son and that when we see Him, we see You. We know that He came to teach us and to show us Your way. And Lord, help us understand what it means to primarily be citizens of heaven more than just citizens of this world. And while we enjoy our comforts and we enjoy all the things that this world brings to us in our modern day, uh, Lord, we pray that You would help our hearts to know what it means to give You true allegiance, true loyalty in the ways that matter. Help us to love one another. Help us to forgive each other. Help us to sacrifice from our time and our resources and our, our skills to build each other up and to create a true community, a true city of God here on earth as we build our churches, as we build our very selves after Your image. Help us to imitate You, O oh God as dearly beloved children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.